are here for our closing panel. And today we're going to talk about what belongs in the C++ standard library. So first, can I have each one of you guys introduce yourself and let's say, tell us about your fa the favorite thing in the standard or Bruce that you've worked on. Worked on. Worked on in what sense? You've been involved with. You, you, can, you can decide how you want to define that. Let's start with you. Uh, I'm Titus Winters. I founded Absail and chair the Library Evolution Working Group. Um, the favorite thing that I've... Mm, hmm. <laughs> I kind of think everything is terrible. Um, that is actually my team's motto. Um, I don't really have a whole lot of favorites. Okay. I think that, that lets people know who you are. <laughs> uh, my name's Michael Case, and I guess the favorite thing I've worked on in Boost would be Spirit. Boost Spirit. Okay. My name is David Sankel, um, and probably the favorite thing that I've worked on would be Variant in the standard library. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, David. <laughs> David, and a little help from us. Yeah. Um, my name is Marshall Clow. I am the um, maintainer of libc++, and I'm the chair of the library working group. And probably my favorite thing in the standard library, oh, there's so many, but I'll, I'll stick with the extended search interface, the Boyer Moore stuff and the Boyer Moore horse pool stuff, because I, I put that into Boost, and then I got it standardized, and I got it added into C++17. Now, Marshall, you said you're the chair of the library working group, and Titus, you're the chair of the library evolution working group. Can you guys just give a very quick uh, 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 description of what those roles are, how those groups are different for people who may not know? So library evolution is focused on API design. We get first look at papers that are proposing new thing, features for the standard library. Uh, and uh, Lug's responsibility is largely, do we want a thing that is shaped like this, roughly? And then do the detail work to like work out the specifics of the APIs, overloads, ref qualifiers, all those things. Uh, and then we argue about names. <laughs> and then when we like it, then we move it to Marshall. Uh, right, and then people, then the proposal comes to the library working group where primarily we're concerned about description, describing this in such a way that the wording that goes in the standard. Um, occasionally we will come across something when, when you try to word something very precisely, all the inconsistencies or the things that are not quite thought out um, come to the fore. The reason that the Boyer Moore stuff was not in 14 instead of 17 was because I, there, it turned out trying to write stuff, write up precise wording, said, I know what I mean here, but I don't know how to say it. And then I realized I didn't actually know what I meant there. <laughs> um, so what we, what we do in library working group is we review the wording and we improve the wording to the point where a library implementer um, can take this and implement it and S several library implementers can come up with things that say, that uh, do the same thing. Um, sometimes we find holes in the design where people have not quite thought it out, so we can't describe it. And then the, the proposer goes away and thinks about it for a while, and it comes back and goes back to talk to Titus's group and says, okay, I, we're ch I want to change the design like this because of these problems that we found. So it's, a, it's kind of an iterative process. In an ideal world, it would go, a proposal would go to LEWG, LWG, and, and into this draft standard. Frequently, it's much more fits and starts than that. So I want to explain the, the, this, the premise of this panel a little bit. So um, what does this question mean? Well, a lot of languages, a lot of other languages have um, much broader and richer standard libraries than C++ does. For example, all of these things, um, this list is things that I just sort of picked off the top of my head, and then also things that I just took from the list of things in the Python standard library. <laughs> so, uh, oh, it is in there. <laughs> it's, it's just a reflection. Yeah, it's just a reflection. <laughs> 
Good catch. So in compare, when you look at many other programming languages like Python, uh, Java, uh, even Swift or Rust, and you compare them to C++, uh, there's really just a lot more stuff that, that's available in these core standard library facilities. And uh, as we continue to evolve C++ and continue to, to, to um, grow the language, um, naturally, people start coming with more proposals to grow the standard library and to add new things and things that maybe are not just um, extensions of existing parts of the library, but are entirely new library features. Uh, as an example, in C++11, we added the regex library. Um, we, I mean, we added a number of uh, other libraries, but that one's sort of a, a self-contained sort of thing. It's a whole new module. Or in C++17, we added the file system library and the parallel algorithms library. We have a number of library technical specifications in flight, um, the networking TS, uh, library fundamentals V3. Uh, Titus, maybe you can help me out with anything else that we... Coroutines. Yeah. Uh, Coroutines. Um, and, and so at some, there, there's, there's sort of a, a little bit of a, a conflict between our desire to put new things into the, into the library and trying to figure out what things should be in the library. Um, should we have you know, a lot of new container types, richer containers types? Should we have things like database access, um, uh, a graphics library? <laughs> um, so what are your guys' thoughts on that? What is the scope of things that belong in the standard library? Um, or what is a, a, a guideline that we should use to determine whether or not something should be, whether a feature should be in the standard library, or whether it's best to be implemented in third-party libraries? I don't want to go first. OK. <laughs> is he deferring to me? Um, so, you know, the, the stated goal of the committee for, for the C++ standard is to standardize existing practice. Um, that's a goal which is sometimes observed more in the breach than in actuality. Um, but uh, the other thing about the standard library is we tend to take things, we have had in the past a, the idea that we take things that are either of widely applicable use or kind of non-portable so that you know you you get you know you get a version that works on your machine with the same interface that'll work on his machine or his machine or her machine. So you can write portable code and the library will encapsulate the non-portable bits. File system is a great example of this. Um, or things that are maybe not quite as widely applicable, but a lot of people use them and they're really hard to get exactly right. Um, shared pointer is a great example of this. Shared pointer is full of interesting little corner cases and subtle interactions that it's hard to get them right. And if we had you know eight different implementation of shared, shared pointers stretched across the world, which we do, um, they would all be behave differently in subtle and incompatible ways. So, you know, for something like that, it's really important to have just one in the um, in that everybody can use. Now, uh, looking back at this big list here, um, there's a lot of things up there that I would really like to have. I'm not convinced that, that which ones belong in the standard library. Um, I think that having a robust third party ecosystem would be good. And some of that kind of goes back to now we get back into infrastructure and ease of combining stuff from different people, uh, AKA build systems, which various people have been trying to do for a long time. So that's a long involved answer to a simple question. Um, my take on this, like, first, like the committee doesn't have a opinion, right? There's like all these people, they all have their own opinions. So here's mine for what it's worth. Um, I think that we don't standardize existing practice enough. And, we, and, we, and whenever we invent stuff in the committee, and my, when I see this stuff, it turns out to be pretty terrible. Like, I don't think that the people in committee should be like inventing stuff and trying to, you know, come come up with stuff from scratch. Things going through Boost, things going through other like libraries where it gets a ton of usage. Then, if you see that, we know it's going to be successful. Um, my my second pet peeve with this is, I don't think we have nearly enough of this stuff. And part of the reason is because we obsess over small details and try to get the most low-level thing possible. Like, I think it's hurting C++. 
tremendously that we can't you know, just start an application and like fetch a URL. We have this networking TS coming, which is really low level and maybe you could figure out how to do that, but practically speaking, you can't just like open up a C++ editor and do some basic logging and, uh, and do some basic networking stuff. And I think that's a problem, um, and it's uh, an existential problem for the language. So I, I, I think it's important that we focus on, it may not be perfect, but there is something called good enough. And you know we can put some stuff in the standard, and then if we have a better idea later, we can put other stuff. That's just my opinion. They like your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Much, much more popular than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm here to represent a user, I guess, of the library. I have no, no impact on the library. But I, um, I think I'm torn constantly between this and, and what to do. Um, it's not something that I haven't thought about. But I, I can tell you my opinion has changed over the years. And uh, I used to very strongly be concerned about the library not focusing on low-level low level things that we could have confidence in and build on and let third-party libraries handle the larger stuff um, to now where uh, there maybe is some more balance somehow in the sense that the ecosystem for C++ is just not very persuasive when you're looking at Rust or a bunch of other things. Why would I choose it given the, the ease of that time to hello world that I talk about sometimes? And um, I think my concern is the best practice thing. Uh, bringing best practices in and saying that this is a, we're going to standardize best practice at some low level, I think we can think about that and understand it and do it. But as the uh, libraries become more complex and they become a higher level interface or, or they're doing more, uh, what was a best practice 10 years ago, none of us would want to be doing for a large number of libraries. And I'd really hate to see that get into the standard and, and then just not be used. People, it would like be this, this black eye, right? Why would I ever do it that way? That doesn't make any sense. This language does it so much smarter, right? So I'd almost rather see things like that in a, in a higher, level thing, higher level library that's third party. Or maybe it's standardized and changes in and out all the time, but it's not like the core standard library. We just have to be opposite. That's fine. <laughs> um, I actually wrote a blog post about this a couple months ago. Um, which probably goes into more detail and is probably stated more clearly. Um, but largely, I think my high-level bit is nothing should go into the standard library if there is active research in that area. Uh, the standard library is really good at compatibility over time, uh, in many cases to the detriment of all else. Uh, the standard does not currently know how to fix its mistakes. Uh, and also, library vendors promise all of you binary compatibility between standard versions. So if you compiled some code post C++ 11, it will still work with today's build of the standard library. And the side effects of those sorts of things mean, like, I cannot in good conscience recommend that any of you use unordered map. Like, that is a terribly designed type. Uh, the, the performance problems in that are just built in. Uh, the default hasher, we can't change the default hasher because we are promising you binary compatibility. Processors have advanced, right? If we use more advanced SSE instructions uh, in std hash implementation, right, we could give you much better performance. And I am not talking out of my hat. Google is doing some amazing things in this space. Uh, we can never give those things to you because we have promised to support what you are doing forever. Uh, and that terrifies me. Like, the standard is a really excellent vehicle for very basic standard vocabulary things, mutex, and vector, and string. Uh, but you'll also notice the most important, most difficult change in advancing to C++11 for a lot of people was string because of the copy on write change, right? Like, given the current priorities of the standard and given the current behaviors of the community with respect to pre-compiled code and not really knowing what binary compatibility entails, uh, 
I really don't want anything to go into the standard unless it is very fundamental and extraordinarily well known. Um, we play a game on my team a little bit of what's the biggest thing in the standard or the standard library that doesn't have a sharp edge, that doesn't have a thing that you should warn people about. And nobody actually has an answer. We just play the game, right? And that's telling. So, so Titus, um, couldn't we, wouldn't one way to, to, to let us put more stuff in the library be to, to change the contract that we make with users uh, about uh, levels of compatibility we guarantee? There is a thing about changing contracts after they are agreed upon. <laughs> <laughs> it's not usually how it works. Um, I am working on sort of a very long-term plan to try to get us in the next five or 10 years to the point where the standard and users understand that when you take a library, a language upgrade, that there may be some work you have to do to like fix your old code. Like we may change the meaning of some things when we got it wrong originally. Um, but the committee has not voted that in yet. Like we're kind of tentative on it. Right. And whether or not we can actually execute on that plan is very pie in the sky. Like, By the way, um, in C++ 17, we took the first amazingly small baby steps stumbling in that direction. There were a few things that were, that had been deprecated in the standard library, cough, auto putter, that were removed. And there, were, there was at least one thing in the language, talking about baby steps. In C++ 17, you can know if you have a variable of type bool, Plus, plus variable B, plus plus B is no longer legal. That's how small a steps people were talking about, and that was controversial. So I have a question for the audience. How many of you guys also use Python to some extent? Yeah. Yeah, everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, like this discussion about, you know, the standard library should have only like really low level details, which we're 100% sure about. I understand the theory behind that, but there's a practice. Right? And we've seen how successful Python is by having a model which incorporates bigger things into it. Not all the libraries in there are great, but most of them are good enough. And look how successful it was in spite of fracturing the community by splitting up Python 2 and Python 3. <laughs> right? I think that you ha I think we have to look at the success of C++ as a language. And if we incorporate some of this other stuff into it, now we also need to get rid of this obsession about you know, breaking binary compatibility, at least for some kinds of libraries. But, um, but basically, I, I, I feel very strongly that this, that this concentration on lower level details is um, it's gonna kill us in the end, because these other languages don't do that, and they're doing a very good job. Let me, but, let me give you, can I, you yeah, wanna go? Uh, just <laughs> quickly, I think. Um, there's a difference in the purpose between Python and C++. Like C++ exists to leave no gap between it and a more efficient, like between, no room for a more efficient language between C++ and the hardware. And Python exists just to be helpful. And we can't like hit you that You can philosophy. be helpful and be fast and have the lower level stuff. I'm talking about adding stuff, not subtracting stuff. Um, binary compatibility in today's commercial world is a big deal. Um, if you buy a copy of Photoshop and you upgrade your OS and you get a new standard library implementation and, that, and your copy of Photoshop that you paid $800 for doesn't launch or crashes, you're going to be annoyed. So why don't they statically link it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like, why don't they statically link it? It's already a bajillion gigabytes. The standard library is not that big. Um, Get over it. I'm, yeah. Why don't you static link? Why don't you statically link with the whole OS? Frankly, well, <laughs> because you might want to run it on a different OS. How about we just get rid of OSs? <laughs> there is Michael. All right. Anyway, um, back back in the day, back. Back in the early days of Mac OS X, there was this long discussion among the people who had founded Next, which, was, which then bought Apple for a negative $400 million. Um, <laughs> but 
There were people there who were unconcerned about binary, incompatibil binary compatibility between macOS 10.0 and 10.1. They said, oh, people can just recompile their programs. Um, fortunately, they were disabused of this notion. So we, we have a few questions, so let's just get one of those back there. So, so the, the question is, who on this panel is, uh, I'm, I'm going to use the term that I used when I was recruiting them, who is pro more stuff in the library, who is anti stuff? More stuff. <laughs> in general, I am in favor of more stuff. I, I might be very picky about what more stuff, but I'm in favor of it. So, so the question was specifically about uh, higher level libraries. Who wants to see more higher level libraries? Not in the I, standard. I can, I can imagine situations where that would be a really good idea. But again, it goes back to the idea of standardizing existing practice. I don't want somebody to come with a GUI library that they, they've written in the last six months that has a user base of four and say, let's standardize this. Now, you show me yeah. something that, that has been out in the field for six or seven years and has user bases in the, in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, I will listen much more closely. OK, so I, we have Michael. So to, to David's point about, about the Python library, uh, the, the value that I extracted of Python is, is mostly its, its package ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's standard library, like, yeah, there's some nice things. But the standard library has pretty much so, a good at least quarter of what's up here. So, so the, the, the question was, um, uh, the, the comment was that Py Python, what, what makes Python easy to use is not necessarily the core libraries, but the packaging system and the ease with, by which you can get packages from, from a centralized repo. I don't think anybody would disagree with when I say that C++ would benefit mightily from a cross-platform portable packaging system. Yeah. Right, yes. So that's the wrong study group. 15 is yours. 16 yeah. is text. SG15 is. Yeah. Uh, so I, I still see some hands. I see Tony, Lisa, probably Matt. Um, it might be best if you guys queue up because it's going to be a little hard for me to see you. Well, if, or if the, you stand they up. They took all the, the mic stands away. Bummer. Yeah. Um, I, yep. Yeah, so, you know, just wanted to point out that, that contradiction we have there. Uh, we want libraries that are solid, that have like six, seven, ten years of experience, whatever. And we want modern libraries. Because mm -hmm. right? for the GUI, it's like, well, I know exactly the library has all the experience, tons of, tons of users. I mean, it's QT. You want that to standard? It's like, eh, it's not quite the style oh. we want right now. Oh, I was going to say X windows, but c yeah. close enough. So the, 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 the comment was that if we ask, if we always look at existing practice, then we, we should be asking ourselves, you know, why not standard QT or something that's not necessarily mm -hmm. reflective of the modern design. Practice is not modern. Yeah, exist, existing practice is not always modern. Absolutely. I, I, I concur with your analysis. All right, let's, uh, uh, we're going to do. Sorry, I think Lisa, then Matt, then we're going to um, move on from questions for the moment. Yes. Can we back up to the slide with the list? Yes. So I want to say something about time here. Is um, when you think about what it takes to standardize library, for a like, size library, some of these occur in a very big library. Minimally three years plus or more. Um, after that, it's going to take another three years before they're in like use. And we're going to, and the standards committee is going to be committing to them to, to that for at least three years after that. Um, and really ought to, we ought to be thinking, yeah, we want even more So if you look at these things, one of these things, and you ask going to be the same thing 10 years from now as it is now. Are we going to want the same or that we, that we would design today in 
eight, ten years, sometimes <coughs> I can say, yeah, you know, that's been very, that has a history of being very stable. It's going to be very similar in ten years, and we're probably going to get something that we're pretty confident in. Some of these, there's no chance that the thing, that the thing is going to be the same in ten years. So, so the, 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 to summarize, the, the comment, the the comment was that the, the process of standardizing something uh, takes a, a long time, and, and because of that that lag, um, we have to ask ourselves: if we stand, if we start standardizing a design for one of these things today, are we going to be happy with that particular design ten years from now when it's actually um, uh, uh, standardized and implemented and people start adopting it? Okay. I would also like to to make a, a, a related point. It has it isn't a theoretical point; it's a practical point. Um, look at all these things. I want to point out to you that Microsoft, Microsoft has a team of three people working on their standard library implementation. That is the largest team that I know of on any standard library implementation. Um, the Libsted C++ is one full-time person and a couple of part-time person, part-time people. Uh, the Libc++ is one full-time person and a couple of part-time people. And I look at this as the one full-time person. I look at this list, and to, to, to channel um, Titus here, I am terrified. I'm terrified because any one of those is a couple years' work. So um, Matt, let's, let's get you. And uh, can you get, pass me that mic? And then can somebody bring this to You don't want Matt. me to talk anymore. Apparently, I've seen it too. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I, I know I saw some other hands go up, but we're going to move along a little bit, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go back to more hands. Yes. Yeah, so part of it was echoing what, what Lisa was saying. I kind of see a division of things on this list. Some of them have to do with kind of uh, general libraries that yeah, do not change over time, and then some of them kind of deal with foreign technologies like JSON. And I'm kind of surprised that we didn't draw the distinction there. That's kind of the distinction that, that I think is, is a very important one. I think it definitely makes sense for the for all of the low-level generic things that, that are timeless to kind of be there. Um, but uh, more generally, I think that the problem with high-level libraries is if you have the high-level library and there's no finer grain things at the lower level, if it doesn't suit your needs, you're just not going to use that thing at all. And it's, it takes a lot of time for us to standardize. And we, we could waste a lot of committee time trying to get this, oh, yeah, there's this nice high-level thing. But ultimately, if it's not perfect in every single way, people just aren't going to use it anyway. And so I think it, it kind of makes more sense to, I think that's one of the reasons why we want to focus on the lower level things, because we can get those closer to being right, and then people can build on top of those rather than having to start from scratch if a higher level thing is wrong. So. What you said earlier about finer grain. Time grain right. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, what, you, what you said earlier in your, in your comment about finer grain ties right in there. If you have smaller pieces that people can compose, they can pick the pieces that they want and interpose their own pieces in places where the ones that the standard library provides don't do quite what they want. Right, yeah, so, so that's what I mean. I think it's, it's, it's much less risky for us to do that. And, it, and it, I think it... Or they can use another language. Yeah, or they can use another language. And then, it, and then just one last thing. So we focused a lot on standardizing existing practice, but I think the problem is in the committee, everybody says that, but then... We don't, e even people who advocate it don't end up actually doing it. For instance, with variant, and I'm glad that we do have variant in the language, but it was a novel implementation of a variant, even though we had like boost. Um, there was no existing practice for this specific design of a variant that has a, it has different invariants than, than boost. And um, I think it's very hard to draw that distinction of, of, of when things are existing practice and when they're not. And I don't know if we can. <laughs> I think it's generally, you know, we want to standardize existing practice unless it gets in the way of what I want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, and in the variant case, if everyone doesn't know the story, uh, optional and any were already in there, and any you should really never be using. <laughs> uh, like, mm, there's a couple good uses of that, but very, very few. And variant is the correct answer in almost all cases where you were going to reach for any, and so we panicked. So, like, we have to do this. I see a very persistent hand in the corner here, so uh, let's... 
I was just, while, my, while Chandler's waiting for the mic, I says, there's a whole family of data structures that you could call variant, and the committee picked one. <laughs> Boost variant is a different set of design choices. In, in a perhaps radical attempt to bring this back to a more panel style thing, I was going to ask the panel a question. Go for it. <laughs> Can anyone on the panel think of a widely successful programming language with a large standard library composed of standardized, not necessarily formally, but like composed from existing practice in that language? Or perhaps a better question might be, when, when we standardized this standard template library, was that existing no, no, practice? No, 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 I'm not asking that question. I'm asking, has there ever been a language in the history of programming languages with a large standard library that was built through standardization of existing libraries? Would Python qualify here? A lot, like a lot of Python, things that get incorporated in the Python standard library were pre-existing things like elementary and... Talk amongst yourselves, that was my question. I want to hear the panel's th thoughts. No. I got nothing. <laughs> so I'm not a Python expert, but um, I've definitely seen that, like I've used Python and I'm like using this third uh, party library and everybody seems to love it. And then a couple of revisions of Python later is now in the standard library. And in like sub substantially sized uh, like libraries <laughs> and uh, elementary is the one that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. I use elementary as well. Okay, um, I wanna try circle back to the wrench that Michael threw in our direction. Um, if the, <laughs> If, if the path to using a third-party library in C++ was not so difficult, perhaps we would not uh, be asking ourselves, should we be standardizing all these things? Because users and us would be happy using the existing things. Um, and so, Titus, I'm, I'm going to start off with you here. Um, recently, there was a, uh, a study group full, formed for tooling on the committee. And I think um, many, in particular, many on the committee um, uh, felt that that might be a place to talk about uh, package management and dependency management. Um, so can you maybe uh, comment as to what you, whether you feel that's, you know, is that what SG15 is doing? Yeah, so SG15 was founded like late last year and we had exactly one meeting so far. Uh, the public, or the mailing list for SG15 is publicly accessible, anyone can sign up. It's not limited to be committee members. Um, so I highly suggest if you are interested in refactoring tooling or package management or any of these things, build systems, all of that stuff, uh, I would love there to be more discussion happening there. And if you go to isocpp.org, you can find uh, links for all that. And are capable of, capable of discoursing, and are capable of discoursing in a courteous manner. Oh yeah, that would also be nice. Please do that. <laughs> um, so originally I kind of assumed that SG15 was going to be more about things like refactoring tooling, but I think uh, even over just this last few months, I think that has evolved, and I think a significant focus of it is going to be on dependency management. And I try to say dependency management over package management, because most of the time that people say package management, I get the impression that they're also sort of feeling like we're talking about shipping binaries. And you may notice I have a strong taste about binaries. Um, but uh, dependency management is obviously sort of a tricky thing because the language itself is so complicated. Uh, because there are macros. Because everyone has a different level of discipline as to build flags. Uh, it's, we don't have a, any sort of consistency on like even how to structure your uh, include paths and things like that. Um, and so I see a lot of good work being done on, like, I will come up with a way to host an index of, like, libraries that are available. I encourage everyone to go check out Conan. That seems to be cool right now. Um, but what I don't see in any of these yet is, in order for you to be a library that is listed in this package, like, index, like, this is how you lay things out, so, th and, if you are using these libraries, this is how you use them. 
And until we get that straightened out, uh, it's just going to be a mess. Um, there's also issues of like, we really, really need to train everyone that you have to build your whole program with the same compiler flags. Um, and until that knowledge has spread, I think all of this is going to be a hard sell. So, so, so there is a, a collection of C++ libraries that have you know, a fairly high bar in the review process to get into them. And I wonder if perhaps that is part of the solution here. Uh, Bryce is uh, obliquely, I think, referring to my day job project for Absale, where um, I have a lot of strong feelings about some of these things because we had to do the like analysis of how are we going to be compatible? Like, what do we mean by like build flags? What are the macros that are being set by your tool chain? Like, we actually have documentation uh, for Absale very specifically about which things are an input to the build and which things we are using as like symbolic shorthand based on platform features. And like one of the things you can't do in Absale is um, like we will try to guess based on your platform features that are being told to us from your compiler uh, whether or not you have feature X, um, like whether thread local storage works. Because there are a handful of supported platforms where thread local keyword is broken. And so we have a shorthand macro for Absol has thread local. And you are not allowed to override that. Like, it is a build error if you try to do that, because we have made it very clear, like, this is the list of actual inputs to the build. And I don't see a lot of other places that have that sort of, like, clarity about, this is a macro. This is not your macro. And until we get that straightened out, having more, uh, until we get that straightened out as a community, uh, library interdependency is going to be hard. So I was actually naturally expecting that you were talking about Boost. I was perhaps too nice. obli oblique in my uh, reference. High quality <laughs> reviewed libraries. That was where I thought he was going. Oh, well, look at that. <laughs> I, I was sort of going with Boost, but... but uh, <laughs> So but I think the, the, um, th this is the main issue, right? It's not whether or not there are tons of libraries that are inside of the standard library or whatnot. As a, as a user, I want access to high quality you know, facilities. And, and how I get them, um, at one level, I don't care. And, th and that's clear by looking at the JavaScript world, who's happy to type. NPM and get who knows what from who knows where, right? So from just a pure user base, I think we can say that people want functionality. They're not necessarily concerned about how it comes from at one degree, you know, at one level, they'll eventually become concerned about that. But, you know, at, the, at level zero, they don't care. And, and um, I, I think the, the problem is, is, I feel confident in certain things. I feel confident that, you know, Marshall isn't going to make huge mistakes inside the library that's being shipped, that he's working on. I feel confident in that library set because it's being used by a lot of people. I feel confident in the boost libraries because of the rigor that they go through in the test mechanisms. There are certain library sets that I feel confident in, but I'm, I'm personally not confident with just like package management, get something from somewhere. So there's, there's this level of trust that has to be built, and I think at, at times, that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about a level of trust. That's why the library is inside of the standard. I don't got anything to say. It's very unusual, though. So I, I agree with you with the level of trust thing, and it's really important. However, in the case of Rust, for example, with Cargo, the level of trust is handled by the community itself. They have this centralized package repository that's called crates.io, and people can you know, vote on packages, they can see statistics on how these are used. And if we had something similar, which is endorsed by the standard, and we allow both the community and respective users to vote on packages and comment on packages, then the level of trust issue will solve itself, kind of. That's yeah, my I, intuition. I completely agree with you. I think there's a lot of ways to get level of trust, and crowdsourcing is one way to get level of trust, right? Um, can you pass?
So does so I'm trying to does the providing a means for users to obtain certain libraries and making making that an easier process does that necessarily mean that it must go through the standard library itself? Could we not provide some? Could we not provide a platform for where where users can access uh, existing libraries like I don't know FMT or the Norman JSON parsing library that are already widely accepted and used? Could we not provide a means of accessing them easier without having to go through standard library? Um, I. My my belief is that's a necessity, and that's not a desirable feature. That is a, a requirement, because um, going back to that list, you know, there are, there there are lots of people out there who are, who are domain experts or are, who are, are who are very interested or obsessed about those kind of things, and they will produce very good libraries. Some of them will produce very good libraries, and if we have an easy way for people to get those libraries, there's no real requirement that they go through a standardization process or that they end up, you know, be shipped as part of a standard library. Um, that's, you know, that's how Python works. That's how, um, uh, I was going to say Java, but Java's, Java's not like that. Um, but Python in particular, you know, the, the, the Python install pip stuff will get stuff that's from all over the world. And that works fairly well for them. And that's, that is a model that I would like us to emulate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, so I think that with this, there needs to be several tiers of uh, like trust. So with the Python model, you have like all the crap that's out there, the stuff that's in, in, the, in the standard library and, and so on and so forth. Other successful, uh, you know, in related fields, uh, things that have worked, for example, Arc Linux, they have a core set of packages, which are high quality, really well maintained. Then they have an, uh, a repository called Extra, which are really well maintained, but we're not saying that's core. And then they have AUR, which is the ARC user repository, which is just like anybody can throw up whatever they got. And that works really well. Um, and I think that with C++, we have a tiny little dinky thing which we call standardization. And it used to be that Boost was like that middle tier, but it doesn't seem to be that way anymore. Now it's just like whatever's out there. So I think that I would like to see personally like standard and have the standard expand to more than just like a dinky amount of things, but also we need these other tiers like something in Boost and then something in the rest of the world and a package manager could you know, make all this come together, but you know, who's gonna do that? So, so it seems to me like the, the question, well, there's sort of two questions. One, is that something that the standards committee should do or that the C++ foundation should do, and if not, who would? And two, um, even if we were to decide how to do something, how would we get implementers to buy in? Because all of the existing packaging systems for C++ out there with the acceptance of VC package are started and driven by somebody that's not a major C++ implementer. And I think that's part of what makes it hard to get buy-in, is that it's, it's something that's a separate piece of software that doesn't come with your C++ implementation. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see if we can get the mic over there. Uh, I think, like, maybe some of the stuff that Winters was uh, sort of commenting on is, is is important here. One thing that's different about C++ is maybe that we do a lot more at compile time than, say, Python would. Um, that that makes things uh, difficult for standardized libraries because like a lot of the people that talk about packaging, they're talking about delivering binaries. But really in my world, when I talk about packages, I mean more something I build because we have so much going on at compile time that it just is not worth considering uh, doing it at any other level. Um, deciding what a package is and being able to support both of those models, I guess, is probably the, the necessary thing. But that leads to yet the third problem. Our binary distribution systems is basically controlled by the OS, like DLLs or those kind of things. Uh, as a C++ standards body, unfortunately, our language has been used for making the OS, and so that means we'd have to convince them how to do their work, uh, or if we wanted to make that in a standardized way so that shared modules were the same as DLLs and these kind of things. It makes it very difficult to, to work across lots of platforms. Uh, 
because of these problems. I guess it's more of a comment than anything else. Uh, but I guess I feel winter's problem because I suffer from the same one at EA. I got a hand in the back. So I'd like to uh, return to the fundamental question for a second. A whole lot of dimensions of this, you can go back to the list though, that'd be great. A whole lot of dimensions um, of this question have been really well addressed, but I think maybe one wasn't, which is sort of the nature of the library. Um, I want to say the, the number of required implementations or the number of useful implementations. So shared pointer or perhaps Unicode, we only need one excellent implementation of that, right? What, why would you need another one? If it does it, it does it. Um, something like Vector, it's, um, there's clearly a number of different designs that um, would be, could be interesting and useful. And it's reasonable, I think, to standardize one of those, or maybe some, sub, some set of those, and not do the others. But then you have something like GUI, and there's more than one completely different, completely reasonable thing to do there. And I'm not sure such things belong in the standard library at all. I could agree with that. And then we had Gene Hyde in the... I, mean, I think you could just look at Java for that, right? Look at the progression of Java GUIs that have come out with Java and, and realize that, well, that one looked like it was good. Oh, we've got a better idea the next time. We've got a, Like all of them, just unless you skin your own or bring your own thing, they all look like trash. So, What do you guys think about the possibility that the question is the wrong question? And what we should be asking is what facilities should be provided by the standards bodies that would encourage um, coalescing on a set of good libraries that are from various locations, places like Boost and others, um, instead of trying to figure out which libraries we should add to the standard. Yeah, I mean, to me, I'm really big on the idea of dependency management and encourage more use in Boost, like, as ways to like model the like multi-tier sort of thing. Um, like I, d I don't see there being any other way to really make that work. The, the standards committee just is not gonna scale to really big things. And like Lisa said, anything that we're not sure is, you know, gonna be solid for 10 years, just the standard is the wrong place for that. And just, I don't wanna sound like I'm in favor of a GUI library and the standardization. Like we, we just can't do that. Like the amount of work that would be involved, we just don't have enough volunteers to do it, um, or people paid on the committee to do it. Um, I think it's a matter of degree, and I think that we've fallen too far into the low level, tiny little bits uh, end of the spectrum. And we need to move a little bit closer to the, include some medium sized but still very useful stuff um, area. And and we could do it, I, there's, there's really nothing stopping us from from pulling in some of these things. It's just a matter of a mentality change. But, you know, as you guys can see, like this opinion which I have is not a majority opinion on the committee by like any extent. Um, I'm just one person there. But it's not an unheard of opinion either. Like no. That's true, that's true. You're not the only person with that opinion. Yeah. So um, I think that to, to answer your question somewhat, um, that falls very much under what the, the rubric which I, you know, glibly tossed off as, you know, a package manager. It's, it's a way of, you know, discovering and, um, and installing and using libraries from everywhere and choosing, you know, g gathering information, you know, discovering what libraries do X and why would I choose this one and, okay, how do I get it on my machine and how do I use it? And there's a whole spectrum of tasks there, there, you know, discovery is one thing in and of itself, installation, documentation, samples, and so on and so forth. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. And um, people have tried, you know, um, some people here at Boost spent a couple years trying to do a package manager and where is that today? It's, it's a hard problem. It's, it's, if I were to start working on this, which I'm not because I have way too much other work. I would start with very small goals and try to make sure that I didn't preclude doing bigger stuff in the future. 
you know, demonstrate success at a small scale and then expand from there. But I mean, that's how I do most, thing, most things. So that's not hardly, that's hardly profound. Oh yeah, so um, I, I guess I kind of want to comment a little bit about the uh, like the binary distribution, the binary compatibility story, um, because for the, the open source library I vend out to users, um, I looked at the possibility of you know supporting this idea of making a static library or DLL out of it so I could ship it to my users, um, and when I tried a little bit of that and I you know I started to get into you know building this and, and, and vending this thing. Um, it quickly became a nightmare because of build flags, because of macros, because of all these different things. And so that's why ultimately, you know, the, ultimately the, the library ended up being, you know, just I turned it into a massive single header and that's how I give it to my users. Um, and, you know, that has some benefits in that I don't have to worry too much about the build problems. You know, I can just uh, use all the macros I can and abstract it away and give people, you know, inputs into my library so they can change it. Um, but it comes with its own set of problems as well. And so uh, I'm, I'm not uh, like I'm not super convinced that we that C++ in and of itself has like the has the tools and the language to make vending libraries like an easy thing to do to begin with. Um, and so I don't know if if anyone on the the panel has any uh, ideas about you know what it means to properly vend out a library and get it to your users so that they can use it without the, everything exploding when they change a binary or something. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I I think. That hits on a lot of the problems, um, very specifically because like C++ is the language that uh, we're not going to tell you you can't do that bad thing, right? We love our undefined behavior. We love our like, yeah, you you can do a crazy thing and like shoot yourself in the foot. You shot yourself in the foot. Um, but the side effect of that is, as a community for the language, there is a whole lot of, well, it builds, as opposed to a whole lot less, well, it's right. Like, there's a lot of things that the language allows you to do that you shouldn't do, or that the language doesn't prevent you from doing that you maybe can't actually get away with. And the sort of cowboy mentality in the C++ community as a whole just exacerbates that. And like, some of what you're seeing there is that, like, just brought up one level and trying to do that for packages on top of packages on top of packages. Oh my gosh, we fell over. <laughs> like, yeah. But uh, so I think some of it is going to have to just come down to like, no, we can't get rid of macros in the language. That's not going to happen, but we will have to as a whole community, listen to guidance and have tools and linters and things to be like, Please, please stop being a, you know, rude user. <laughs> I'm I'm going to uh, going to state the obvious again, just because um, of something he said. Um, there's there needs to be a place for both binary distributions and source distributions, because, for example, I I do a lot with compilers. Shock, I know. Um, but I have downloaded, I have binary distributions of Clang and GCC, and sometimes I build GCC, and oh, just about every day I build Clang for various reasons. Um, and there need to be distributions on both, because sometimes I have to dig into it and, and figure out why something's going, doing the way it is, and sometimes I can just use it as a black box. Where, where does the standardization committee and and vendors start because there's a certain thing like where it goes to the distribution of it it's isn't that really what it gets to is we are we going to be standardizing exactly the layout of binary like irs that are going to be distributed and they're going to be linked together with something or is it a case that that's actually someone else's problem and the committee is just really there to make the standardize the practice of these things like how would how would this even work so like the binary compatibility thing is a very big problem for us. Um, so the, the vendors will frequently say like, well, it depends on the vendor, right? So Microsoft, for uh, you guys who've used uh, Visual Studio, um, they just produce a new uh, library and they give you a new DLL every so often. I think this has changed recently. Um, but they would generally just, you have a new thing that you link against and that's it. So whenever the binary incompatibility thing came up, they'd always be like, ah, don't care. 
Um, but but other vendors, like it's it's very important for them if you try to like upgrade the lib stdc plus plus on a Linux distribution, and if it's like binary incompatible with the previous version, like all the applications that are on that Linux system, like what do you do? Um, but the issue is like short-term versus long-term thinking. Like in order for us to be able to progress at a quick enough rate, I, I really feel like we're going to have to be able to make binary incompatible changes. Like every once in a while, not not frequently, not without like foresight and stuff like this. Uh, but I think we need to start getting a lot more comfortable with this um, because it, it seems like a short-term benefit. Oh, well, I don't have all these problems when I upgrade my Linux distribution, but we need to get that long-term gain to where we can actually move the standard because if the, if the standard is stuck, then it's going to get old and uh, problematic. Uh, my poster child for uh, binary compatibility is Sony. Is Sony. The Sony PlayStation. Games are, games are written for the PlayStation in C++. Their goal for the PlayStation 4 is if you bought a game in 2014 when the PlayStation 4 was new, and you go out and buy a PlayStation 4 in 2023, when it's near end of life, when they're going to about to introduce the PlayStation N plus one or whatever they care to call it, that game better run. That is, that is their stated goal. Any PlayStation 4 game will run on any PlayStation 4, period, full stop. Okay? Binary, important, binary compatibility is, is a critical requirement for them. It's not a critical requirement for everybody. Okay? So uh, we are unfortunately out of time. So uh, I don't think we'll be able to take any more questions. I want to give each one of the panelists a last chance to comment, uh, comment on this subject matter though, before we close up. Uh, I'll say once again, um, if you're interested in these things, uh, these topics of discussion, uh, go track down the SG15 mailing list uh, from ISOCPP. Um, their discussion there is sort of early days and sort of fits and starts, but I would like to see a whole lot more uh, uh, participation there. And just, you know, keep be a part of the community because it's going to require a community and community best practices and all of those things uh, for us to actually make any progress here. So I think in the terms of being part of the community, I was going to I was going to say I think there might be a resurgence of Boost and its usefulness now as we move and, and start moving forward, and we need help in Boost. And I know a lot of you here have been like passionate about C++ and. Actually, I've had questions like, well, how can I be involved? Be, be involved in Boost. You will, you will learn a ton, and you will give a ton. It's a great place to help with this tier of how we're going to get libraries out. Um, just with, like, with a closing comment for myself, uh, the, the standardization committee, like the way that things run right now and the, and the pace at which we've been doing things, this does not always have to be this way. Things can change, and things can change in major ways. And uh, for any of you who are thinking about getting involved and you know facilitating some of these changes, I highly recommend that you you know get on the reflector or not the reflectors, but get on the stood proposals mailing list. Write some papers. Come on to committee meetings. Encourage your employer to to fund you to come, because we could use uh, a lot more people who are representative of the community. Uh, like it would be very very helpful to have that. We can do some really big things. And I would like to comment on that, that things have changed on the Standards Committee greatly. Compare the last eight years to the previous eight years. 2002 to 2010 versus 2010 to 2018. I mean, yeah, it's a cheap shot. <laughs> but the Standards Committee has gone from releasing a, a, a new standard every eight to 10 years to releasing a new one with full of new stuff every three years. Um, part of the problems that we are having t today is we, ha we are having an uh, problems built on our own success is that we are moving things forward faster than ever before. Doesn't mean we can't do better. Don't get me wrong, okay? But we are moving things faster than we ever did before, and some of the, the, some of the problems in that are becoming more and more apparent, and some of the things we're, the processes we are using are becoming kind of creaky. And so, 
we will have to we will have to do things with that. Boost is also suffering from that, by the way. And the people in who were in library in a week this week are making an attempt to address that on Boost. And if you think that that's important, Boost is still a great place to discover things to to use Beeman's uh, language when he founded Boost to invent existing practice. You know, that's the, if you say the standard uh, standards committee is to standardize existing practice. Boost was founded to invent that existing practice. And that's a great place to try things out and to get a user base and get feedback and build tools that benefit the entire community. So. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause. Yeah.